everybody, welcome to Hit Rewind. This episode, we continue in our discussion of films of 1995. I'm Michael, and Jacob's on the other side. Hello, everybody. <laughs> the lineup and the pitch. All right, so this episode, we have five films, like usual, that we're going to discuss. Jacob, what is the first one you would like to start off with? Let's go, uh, let's go with Cutthroat Island. That's what I want to start with. I mean, overall, this movie could have been shorter if it wasn't for all the slow-mo. I felt like there was about almost 20 minutes of slow-mo within this movie. Yeah. This is an era where slow-mo, <laughs> slow-mo was so crazy popular. I mean, we talk, we joke about like the John Woo, but that really did change action films where everybody started doing that slow-mo. Except his always was more balletic, you know. It just it it was more like a musical rhythm flow that he had with his slow mo. This this. So I don't hate no. Cutthroat Island by any means. It, it was for the longest time the biggest flop in history. It destroyed a company, and and thank God they already had Long Kiss Goodnight uh, ready, you know, already filming when this came out, or it, they would have shut it down for sure. Which is a much better film than Cutthroat Island. But Cutthroat Island is one. That was such a disastrous production. So, it was Michael Douglas instead of Matthew Modine. And then he demanded that the rewrites make him an equal character to Gina Davis's. And it just, when, when the rewrites were done, he said, no, never mind. So they already, they already spent that money doing rewrites. He walked away. They offered it to fucking everybody. If you look it up on Wikipedia, they offered it to, like, every guy in Hollywood. <laughs> it's insane. Like... Holy shit! If you if you offered Charlie Sheen, who at this time was coming off a, a few flops, you think that he would have said yes? But maybe his ego couldn't stand being second banana. Who knows? But um, they went to Matthew Modine because uh, he knew how to fence, and plus, you know, he was reasonably priced, and they were starting to like, ooh, we spent a lot already on this. So they got him. He's not the biggest name at this point. It's quite a few years after Married to the Mob. Um, the set pieces that were built were not t- what was ordered at all, not even based around the script at all. And Rennie Harlan was so busy finding someone to replace Michael Douglas that he was not able to pay attention during that. And when they saw the set pieces, they're like, well, we're going to have to rewrite the whole script and redo it. But so they had to tear all those down and rebuild them again. That added more to the budget. And then there was like sewage problems that busted like the pipes above the, the area where they're supposed oh. to swim. So they had to empty all that, clean it out. And stuff like that. And you're always and shooting on water, of course, is notoriously expensive. We've seen that with all the Pirates of the Caribbean and, and Waterworld and stuff like that. And um, it, it really we went from like a $60 million movie to a $100 million movie. And oh. so the company, you know Carol Cole. They're like legends yes. of action at this time. They were bankrupt. They were done. They filed for bankruptcy before this even came out. But they were contractually obligated to deliver this movie. So they had to shut down another movie, which looked more profitable, called Crusades, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and directed by Paul Verhoeven. And they already sunk $13 million into that. So, Holy shit. So they had to take the cost of that and put it on top of the budget of Cutthroat Island. So you're looking at a movie that actually probably cost $65 million in the beginning and just escalate, escalate, escalate. And like we were talking with Dracula Dead and Loving It, they released it Christmas Day of 95 against what we found out was like nine or ten movies that was released like either that day or two days prior it had no fucking chance so it got this stench on it forever as like the biggest fucking disaster losing money doesn't mean it's a bad film it doesn't we've seen this a lot but it's not a great movie and i think you're right it's too long i'm not convinced of gina davis whatsoever in this movie I would have loved to see someone more like Sigourney Weaver or Linda Hamilton, but they weren't bringing in the money like the way that Gina Davis was because she had just come off, what, three big hits? So Yes, of course. Yeah, so I can see why they're like, well, she's a big star right now, but I'm not convinced of her in this role. But everybody else is on fucking fire. Frank Langella is chewing this like a, a, a chicken wing. <laughs> um, oh, God, yes. Hands down. Uh, absolutely. Just very brutal. Very brooding, brutal, just like no hold bar, willing to do whatever just to get his piece of the map. Oh, God. And one of them was a chunk of skin. Yeah, that was gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like, well, I mean, considering how pirates were, I mean, I feel, I feel, I feel like this isn't too far from the truth. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. That was the other one. So uh, Oliver Reed was supposed to be in this. I guess they filmed a day with him. 
but he was horribly intoxicated the whole time, and he whipped his dick out and showed it to Gina Davis. So they fired him, so they had to go back and reshoot his scenes with a guy who looked really close to him. <laughs> I know. I figured that guy did look familiar. I'm like, that's not Oliver Reed, though. Yeah. Like, I mean, he looks, he, he's, he looks like a stand-in for Oliver Reed. But, yeah, that's another problem this movie ran into. Um, but I think Matthew Modine is tailor-made for this movie. He oh, is down. fun, swashbuckling, charming as hell, and he looks like he's having the time of his life, even though it had to be a brutal production, because you can see a lot of those stunts are them. There, You don't see that. You know the, the, the cheap tricks they do with uh, with older movies to make it look like, oh, it's, it's them, but they like cover their face, or it's a stand-in, they keep their, you know, their head away from the camera, something like that. But yes. you see, like, Gina Davis literally coming out of that window, flipping onto the roof, onto the horse. I don't know how they did that without killing her. I know, seriously. Well, I mean, you look at someone like Michelle Yeoh, and you wonder, oh, oh my gosh, she's still around. Yeah. You know? The, but, man, my props to Gina Davis for actually doing her stunts big time. Yeah, yeah truly impressive. And, I mean, it, they spend the money. Do You really do see it. The war between the boats is insane to me that they're just, like... <laughs> Those don't look like miniatures. I really don't think they're miniatures. Absolutely, yeah. No, honestly, like battles like that, big armada, ship battles. Again, yes, you got to go for a big spectacle, and they delivered that, like you know, beautifully. I, I don't understand how you win a battle like that. You all, you have all the same <laughs> cannons. You're all shooting at the same exact thing. You just get lucky, I guess. There's no real strategy. <laughs> I don't. It's a Hollywood thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it comes to movies like that. But every time I see that. Every time I see a, a scene like that, I just think of the Looney Tunes, you know, the Bugs Bunny versus um, Yosemite Sam when they're pirates. That's <laughs> oh what God. it felt like to me, and I was like, oh, this is just going to turn cartoonish. But, I mean, it's it's a, it's not a tight film, but it is fun. Oh, absolutely. No, definitely. I mean, this is definitely more of, like, you know, something to watch during the summer. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Bad release timing, as you said, I think definitely hit it, hurt it. Yeah. Um, what is our next film? Okay, next film definitely kind of takes place in a more ancient era as well. Um, first Night. I remember this being on HBO a lot. My mom watched it. And, of course, I don't know, everybody had the hots for Richard Gere on that time. I'm not sure. I don't know. I was a kid. But, you know, it being, you know, uh, King Arthur, Lancelot, Guinevere, you know, that was what got me interested because, you know, growing up, I was into that. I was into the mythology of Camelot and King Arthur. Yeah, well, we had so few sword <laughs> sorcery movies before Lord of the Rings. And, you know, and indecent ones were even rarer. I mean, you have maybe five or six I can count on one hand before Lord of the Rings that were like, oh, this is a decent budget. This is a decent cast. You know, yeah, Willow, Beastmaster, Conan, uh, Legend, and uh, I don't think I count Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. The one weird thing about this is that they take all the mystical elements out of it. It's not like Excalibur. No, no, no. Oh, not at all, no. Or like the musical Camelot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just there's... I, I watched this, and I watched Kid and King Arthur's Court uh, back-to-back, and it's like everything that's missing from First Night is thrown into into Kid and King Arthur's Court, <laughs> where you have <laughs> you have magical elements in Merlin and Excalibur, the sword, sorry, the Knights of the Round Table, you know, stuff like that. And I remember they were saying the big problem with the movie is that Richard Gere and Sean Connery were just too old for those characters. Now, if Richard Gere had been King Arthur and they had cast someone younger as Lancelot, I think it would have worked better. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. For sure. Yeah, that's a, that is the thing that kind of threw me off. I'm like, why is he so old? Well, also, I didn't notice until this time, I really don't think Sean Connery was on that set for more than, like, a, a week or two. It, I was like, oh, they put him on the poster, he, you know, he was obviously the highest paid in this, but I'm like, he's not really in this movie very much. No, I mean, compared to Richard Gere and, uh, oh gosh. Oh, Julio Armand. Oh, I had the worst crush. Yeah, I know, it's like, not Natalie Dormer, right? Is that her name? Is that her? Uh, Julie Ormond was the one that was in Legends of the Fall and Sabrina with Harrison Ford. Then it seemed like she just kind of disappeared. Yeah, Julie Ormond, yeah, that's who she was. Yeah, no, honestly, she did such a great... I thought she did uh, quite a great job as Guinevere. You know, very st- very steadfast, stubborn, hearty, you know, not your typical damsel in distress like her handmaidens. 
Yeah, it's. I can see this got greenlit, especially at the budget that it was, because of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. I mean, that thing cleaned up the box office, made like three hundred fifty million dollars, and so I can see that audience. It's from the director of Ghost, and this is a weird side note, but I got into a. I, I don't even think I got into the fight. Okay, so last year on Twitter, someone was posting, "How the fuck did they give the guy who directed Airplane seventy five or a hundred million dollars to direct First Night?" And I was like, a hundred million dollars? And I went and looked on Wikipedia and I was like, I remember everybody talking about this being like 55, 60 million. And I showed him Wikipedia, whatever. And I said, dude, what? He ripped me a new asshole. He blocked me and talked shit about me. <laughs> Nonstop. He was like, you don't know, man. You're too young. You weren't there. And I was like, I was in college when this movie came out. I know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Seriously. And not to think, yeah, holy crap. Like Jerry Zucker. I mean, that, that's another thing that threw me off. I'm like, no way. Did yeah, but... Airplane and... There is... Secret? There, there is, yeah, there's the parody stuff that he was known for. But, you know, he also did um, Ruthless People, and that made a lot of money. But once you make Ghost, and it makes like $400 million worldwide off a $30 million budget, you pretty much write your own ticket. And that was... That had romantic and supernatural. It had a little bit of action in it. But you, you can see the elements of that in First Night, because it's much more romantic than any of the other King Arthur interpretations, I would say. I haven't seen Camelot the musical, though, so... Right. Well, I will say this about um, the little love affair between Lancelot and, uh, you know, Guinevere. was handled a lot better than the actual mythology. Like, you know, casting Lancelot out and, you know, wanting to burn Guinevere alive and Lancelot coming in to save her. I'm glad it didn't work out to that. It was just, you know, Lancelot being banished. Yeah. Or it, being... And yeah. of course, there was a little civil war going on with one of his former knights, Prince, uh, played by Ben Cross. Uh, Prince, uh, oh gosh, Prince Maligant. Yeah, I think I think this is was supposed to be Ben Cross's big comeback. I think he gives a fucking hell of a performance. I really enjoyed every second of it, and I wish it had worked out for him. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I know. I I just love the part where he like his character finally died. I'm like, yes, he's a great villain. Now I want him to die. <laughs> Uh, his sword is yeah. interesting. It looks like it has like these little sword, like razor blades along them, like saw blades. It's really interesting design. Oh, definitely. Like again, movies like this, it's like you know, in order to make the you know villain kind of stand out, they will give him like a especially unique looking weapon. Yeah. But also, yeah, Liam Cunningham was also in this as well, and I like him from Game of Thrones and uh, his voice work uh, for Masters of the Universe. He's um, Man at Arms in Revelation. I have to look up who that is because I don't know who Liam Cunningham is. Yeah. Blue oh, eyes. wait. Yes, I do. Oh. Yes, I do. The second I started typing it, I remembered. Yeah. He's one of those guys in a bunch of action movies for a while. I can't remember what else he was in, but I feel like he was in a couple, uh, he was a bad guy in a couple of big uh, action movies in the 90s. Yeah, no, definitely. And, of course, like him coming in Game of Thrones known as the uh, Onion Knight, Sir Davos Seaworth. That's what he played. That's what really got me hooked. I'm wrong. I think I have him confused with somebody else because I don't see any of the big action movies that were in my head. So never mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you silly man. You man. silly git. <laughs> you silly salt. Yeah, this, so this wasn't, so that, <laughs> this wasn't that successful when it came out in theaters. It only made like $40 million, but it was huge internationally. And like you said, this is the kind of thing that played very well on video and HBO nonstop for a while. Oh yeah, no, that's where it's found its audience. This is where this is one of the very first movies where I discovered, hey, if you put two VCRs together, <laughs> <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge, no, say no more, say no more. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, what's the next film? Next one was actually a true story, and again, great job by Ron Howard, and you know, great performances by everybody involved. Uh, Apollo thirteen. I, I really didn't think this was gonna hold up. For some reason, I thought, oh, you know, everybody just... It was one of those of-the-moment kind of movies. And I remember how we all said, Houston, we have a problem. It was like a, a joke in like every movie for years. And this fucking works. I don't know how it oh works. Because God, yes. if you think about what happens... Not much. But it's all contained in this two these two places, basically. is You know, the, the, the NASA down uh, on Earth... And then up in space, them trying to, as fast as they can, fix a problem, fix a problem, whatever, do whatever they can to get them home safely. And it was truly stressful and, and amazing performances. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. From Ed Harris to um, got the entire supporting cast: Gary Sinise, Kim Bacon, Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, and it's funny um, is it didn't Ed Harris? I believe won Best Supporting Actor in this. And if you think about what he has to do, it is all performance. He doesn't have really any set pieces. He doesn't have a whole lot to work with. He just bounces off of his cast. And this was the third, I think, uh, maybe fourth uh, Oscar nomination for Tom Hanks. And everybody was like, is he going to win three in a row and set a record? No, but hey, it's still a, it's still a really great thing to be nominated. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I'm like, plus he's no one, he doesn't have to prove anything else. No. I mean, he's, he's Tom Hanks. We know how great he is. Mm. Also, the viewpoints of like you know the families at home, like Kathleen Quinlan. Yeah, who's you know, severely who's all this. severely underrated. I think Kathleen Quinlan is one of the best of her era, and she really doesn't get a lot of attention. Mm. Oh my gosh! And then there's of course Tracy Reiner, Betty Spaghetti from League of Their Own. She is was that in that as well. Okay, I was wondering who that was. Yeah, I mean, every time you look over anybody's shoulder, you like, oh, it's that guy, it's that guy, it's that guy. I mean, it's just loaded to the gills. Oh, absolutely. Oh, heck, you know who I noticed was in this? Was, uh, what is his name? Mitch from uh, Real Genius. Oh, was yes, thank you. Genius. I was wondering if you were going to notice that because, you know, it's a decade later and he does somewhat look different. <laughs> I mean, he's not a kid anymore, but he has a very, uh, fairly significant role. He doesn't have a lot to say, but he's always on camera. Oh, absolutely, I know. Like, when I noticed him, I couldn't help but react like Val Kilmer. Mitch! <laughs> and when it, comes to, when it comes to these kind of movies, I don't think they always work. I, I think the right stuff, as much as it's critically acclaimed, um, I thought it was kind of boring. Same thing for First Man. And this is the weird anomaly where everything just... I mean, it's, a lot of it's because Ron Howard is an entertainment machine. He can take really mundane stuff like the paper... And make it absolutely fascinating. And um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think John Sales came in who had done um, Eight Men Out to do a lot of script, script like punch up and clean up some stuff, whatever, to make the dialogue stronger and, and make it flow better. Right. Uh, now what was he? What else did he uh, written again? Sorry. Well, John Sales started off in uh, lots of uh, lower budget horror films. He did Piranha, The Howling. Uh, oh, what's the sword movie? Um, the Challenge with Scott Glenn, and then he did those movies in order to write and direct his own smaller budget films. I think the most well known film of his is Eight Men Out, but he's directed a lot of really great films. He was the original writer of E.T., but it was horror then, and then they had someone else come in and rewrite it. Oh. Hey, well, good because I was wondering how Bumblebee would uh, play out <laughs> it ended up being a horror movie. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. I just I, there's not a whole lot to say with this. It's all based on a true story, obviously. There is a TV movie that came out the next year called Apollo Eleven, which isn't bad. It's a Canadian uh, film, whatever. Uh, so it's a lot lower budget, but it was on. I want to say it was the one of the very first Fox Family. Uh, originals and it's on YouTube for free because I don't think it was ever on VHS. So if you like Apollo 13, you can go and watch, you know, Apollo 11, which was I think like three years before the disaster. So it's amazing what happened in that and that they continued <laughs> to keep going. And people, so fucking astronauts, man, are fearless, and I, I truly respect them. Oh, absolutely, hands down. Uh, you know, watching those scenes when they're in zero gravity, I'm like, were they were actually filming in zero gravity. What they had was, it was called the Vomit Comet. And it was a, a regular plane that could um, go very, very, very high above the clouds and then drop really fast. But it could only drop for like two or three minutes at a time, so they had to shoot all that stuff very fast. Holy shit. Yeah, and they said it was so exhausting for the cast, they had to take time off afterwards and resume filming later. Like, they would shoot other stuff while they were like, oh my god, we got to recover from <laughs> this. I, I imagine it would fuck up your inner ear really bad. I know, so it's like, so it makes me think, like, at the end of the movie, the way they were looking all, like, you know... Peaked? <laughs> out of it, I'm like, yes. I'm like, was that after... Was, was that filmed shortly after those sequences? Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> that. that had, if you told me, like, you could offer me, like, $10 million to be in it, and, like, you gotta go with the vomit comment. Well, let me think about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, gosh. I'm like, just don't eat, just don't eat anything heavy. <laughs> uh, all right, what oh, is the gosh. next one? Oh, this next one. Oh, God, I definitely remember 
quite up as a kid. I mean, they definitely marketed it quite a quite a bit, especially with their toys. Surprisingly, Congo. Yeah, I I, I forgot that um, that it was supposed to be the next Jurassic Park. Everybody was pushing it hard. Yes, they had the toys. I remember that, and. Uh, and it was, so Michael Crichton, it's from Frank Marshall, who was a Steven Spielberg kind of partner. He was a guy that helped co-run Amblin. And he had come off of doing, like, uh, Arachnophobia and Alive, and those did well. And so they were poisonous as the big summer movie of 95. It did okay. It got terrible, god-awful reviews. And it did very well internationally. And, of course, like, you and I, we just... Well, no, I saw this in theaters. I forgot. I saw this... With Casper, which is a weird combo if you think about it. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, usually at the drive-in, what our drive-in would always do is they would take two movies from the same company. It was almost always Universal for some reason, or Warner Brothers. And it would always be an older film, like, you know, three or four months older. And then they would put it as the double bill with a brand new movie. So it's very strange that we got Congo and Casper fairly soon after they came out, and they were from different companies because you got Universal and Paramount. So I, that must have been just some weird anomaly. Oh, yeah, hands down. I mean, God, the way it plays out, I'm like, oh, my gosh, they really marketed it. Like, were they really trying to get kids to see this? <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> well, I mean, Jurassic Park did so well with kids. I mean, when we went opening weekend, and it was just packed to the max with kids. And I'll say apes are slightly different than dinosaurs when it comes to kid appeal. Though, we did have a long history of kids showing up and keeping the Planet of the Apes franchise alive, so what do I know? I mean, there's all those apes, kids movies in the 80s, whatever that, uh, for some reason, people made. <laughs> Dom DeLuise, anybody? <laughs> um, oh my god. I think oh man. the second half is better than the first half, but you need all of that story. I mean, they're, they're condensing the novel as best they can. And so there's a lot of front-loaded exposition and just getting to the Congo, which takes up a lot of time. Yes, of course. Oh, man. I mean, just everything they had to go through, like with, you know, setting up a particular area with the original survey team, Bruce Campbell at the beginning, you know, got to appreciate that. I was so heartbroken, though. I was so heartbroken because this is when I I started becoming a massive Bruce Campbell fan. And then he gets killed off instantly. I'm like, aw, damn it. No. Well, he ended up, yeah, he ended up staying dead. Oh man! And then, of course, there's of course the particular uh, gorilla aspect. You know, there's one character before gorilla. You know, developing particular um, uh, communication device that makes sounds as you, you know, create the sign, uh, create the uh, sign language. Yeah, which was a very interesting character. I, I mean, so I know that it's not a real gorilla. But good lord, that's a good costume. And so you, I, I kept questioning. I was like, that is a fake gorilla, right? That's a <laughs> and, and, and having the voice added to it just brings another level of empathy to that character. Stan Winston is notorious for saying, I don't do special effects, I create characters. And that's what he does with Amy. Oh, absolutely, hands down. Again, it was tough to like even tell like as a kid if that was a fake gorilla or not. It's so good. It's, I mean, even the lips, whatever they did to make the lips move, it's not in that normal robotic puppetry way it, I don't know how they did it it's so amazing oh absolutely man and uh, again like the cast of characters you got Laura Linney I mean Dylan Wallace of course from Nip Tuck yeah Laura Later. Linney is fucking badass in this I adored her oh absolutely I mean especially like you know finding out her background like her character's ex-CIA but she's trying to find her uh, partner you know yeah. she's not there to necessarily for her boss entirely of course because her boss you know being in telecommunications you wanted to get a hold of the diamonds just so he can get some more money to you know keep his station afloat and move on to the next thing right right played by Joe Don Baker oh mm-hmm. god did you want to punch him in what the a, face what a greasy so he, well. if, if, if uh, a big toe had a face it would be Joe Don Baker <laughs> <laughs> right if you left a loaf of over. pumpernickel out in the sun that's Joe Don Baker <laughs> <laughs> No, Ernie Hudson, of course. Oh, he kills it, doesn't he? He is so good at this. Oh, absolutely. He stands out. He's calm, cool, and collected. He knows, he knows his shit. He, like, if, like, if you're with him, he'll get you out. He's the closest thing. Well, I mean, Laura Linney, I guess, is the main star, but I almost say that he's the star of this movie. Oh, yeah. No, he's definitely the hero. He's the, the one that ends up surviving. Yeah, no he's less. the badass. Thank God, because after Leviathan, 
Oh, I don't know if you've have you ever seen Leviathan with Peter Weller and him? Right at the very end. Uh, <laughs> yeah, makes me so mad. I know. Oh, and then Tim Curry. Oh, Tim Curry to me was just comedic. Oh yeah, his. Uh, I my favorite scene in this whole movie is when he's eating the sesame cake and Delroy Lindo just looks at him. Stop eating my sesame cake. <laughs> I know, but I mean, I mean, the first time he tells him, he just has like that nervous struggle. He's trying hard not to eat it. <laughs> it's like, how could you take that? You know, particularly look so seriously. I'm pretty sure there had to be outtakes of them just laughing. At, yeah, it had uh, to been to so difficult to get through that. Um, <laughs> what was I? Uh, I think the big problem is is that unlike Jurassic Park, where you get. Um, the dinosaurs almost immediately in one way or another, you have to wait a long time for the actual beats. And I think that's what slows it down a little bit. Because the first half of the movie is just the terror of the jungle going through places where government is falling apart and they're having coups. And then there's a giant hippo, which is fucking awesome. <laughs> People don't oh, realize hippos are very dangerous. Yes, I know. It's like they look they friendly and you can just hug them. But no, they will swallow you whole. Yeah, and Don't. that I thought that was an exciting sequence, and they were smart to shoot it in the dark with water. What I love is this is one of the last practical effect movies, and I think that um, even like the matte shots at the end with the volcano exploding and them jumping around, I think it's all matte shots. I don't think it's digital, and I am truly astounded how good it is. But it does feel like that's the last chance you'll see all practical effects. Like soak it in, everybody. Yeah, I think I think it's an underrated movie. I think critics overhated it. I don't know what their problem was exactly, but I remember just the previews were terrible. I couldn't either. Like for the life of me, I'm like, okay, wh- what exactly was that wrong with this movie? I think they like a lot of people were just expecting, you know, Steven Spielberg Jurassic Park level, and when it didn't meet that, they were like let down. And so that doesn't make it a bad movie. No, of course not. I mean. Yeah, it's Frank Marshall, but it's not Steven Spielberg. That's the difference. They're two entirely different people. Yeah, yeah. Um, <gasps> what is our next film? Okay, our next one. Okay, I had to save this for last, especially with, you know, for those who celebrate Easter, Good Friday coming up. I had, I had to talk about the best Friday. I <laughs> didn't think this was going to hold up. I thought maybe this was of the moment kind of movie where, you know, you got together with your college buddies and, and just watched it and whatever. A little bit like Billy Madison. This is way better than I remembered it being. If you are old enough and, and you notice the details, the nuances in the characters buried underneath all the wackity schmackity, there's, there's a grounded reality and it has a lot on its mind about where young black men were, especially during this era where they were treated just like criminals just because they were black. And, you know, they're in this neighborhood where things are already just a little bit tipped against them. And it doesn't say it outright, the challenges that they face. But there's an an undercurrent of slight hopelessness, especially from Ice Cube's character, where he's just like, what's the point? I lost my job for a stupid fucking reason or whatever, which doesn't really get explained. It's kind of hinted at. And yeah, he was wrong, like he was wrongfully terminated. Right, wrongfully terminated. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't want to keep spinning his wheels at a job that doesn't appreciate him. And he's got a friend who's going nowhere, who's constantly just like high and getting him into trouble. And there's the bullies in the neighborhood, and there's the threat of real violence and, and the pressures from your parents. And I, I really get that because you know what is he? Probably about twenty three character wise in this. That's that weird age where you're like, well. I kind of don't really think I'm ever going to go to school. School, The regular school is way over, but I don't know where my career is if I have a career. Right. And it can't, Yeah, exactly. Like, behind all those jokes, there is substance and depth, which F. Gary Gray, you know, pointed out perfectly. Especially that little uh, scene at the end. Uh, I think three quarters of the way through the movie where Trey pulls the gun, a nice huge character, and John Witherspoon comes up to him and teaches him about you know, getting back on your feet. Yeah, he's like, or, well, you're gun- yourself to something. Yeah, he said, guns are for sissies. Back in the day, we answered with this. And he shows his fists or whatever. And I, I, I'm of the same belief. I think, unless it's extreme circumstances, I think guns are for pussies. That, that's an easy answer for people, especially if you're a bully, because you can just whip that out and tell people to fuck off instead of actually, 
okay, you know what? We're gonna take this man to man, face to face, or whatever. It, it's it's a it's a I think it's a fucking weak ass way out. Oh, absolutely, yeah, and of course, I mean, cowards usually always go for that first. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not, like I said, I'm not anti-gun. There are legitimate reasons. You live in the fucking woods, you might want to have a rifle or shotgun on you in case a wolf or a bear comes around or, <laughs> you know, something like oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, or or just whatever. But I'm just like, yeah, it just seems like it's as easy, like, oh, we're just going to skip to this and, you know, instead of, like, the, the normal steps you take to defend yourself. Right. But also, as far as the comedic aspects, oh, my gosh. the, the <laughs> Chris Tucker... And John Witherspoon, I will have to say, like, when it comes to, like, moving their faces around, oh, oh my god, gosh, yeah. like, their facial expressions are just top-notch, and you can't, like, recreate that so easily. This like, was... you have to be Jim, Jim Carrey is the only closest person that I think yeah. can do it. Johnny Witherspoon was always kind of one of those around comedians, you know, like, he was always doing stand-up, and he was always kind of in the background, but this was really, like, pushing him to the forefront. I mean, he really shines, and he's hungry for it, you know, to... I think he he was in a really terrible spoof movie of uh, Basic Instinct a couple years before this called Fatal Instinct. Uh, Armand Desante and Sean Young are in it, and Carl Reiner directs it. And you think it would be funny, but they don't let Johnny Witherspoon do anything. And then all of a sudden, Friday's like, no, this is how you cast him, and you just let him go. The fact that he just has a conversation with his son in the bathroom while he's pooping, no way, no way would I... <laughs> Either way, I would not be on the toilet, nor would I be anyone near... The pooping is my private time. I don't know if there's ever been a situation where I'm more vulnerable than when I'm duking. <laughs> oh, God, yes. Especially when I'm on, like, again, if I'm on that, like, you know, if I'm on the toilet, oh, God, no. If anybody, like, tries to open the door without even knocking, oh, I get immediately pissed. Oh, like, yeah, I, that's, like, the scariest feet. thing. I don't know why more slasher movies just don't do this. Shake that door enough, you'll kill the guy with a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> like the perfect slash your hands are clean <laughs> well look what happened to Big Fish all the guy do is just looking at a magazine and then bam <laughs> or Clerks I think is, he was looking at a newbie magazine and has a heart attack while pooping Elvis died from pooping <laughs> um, and yeah Chris Tucker all of a sudden out of nowhere he is the biggest deal in the world He, I mean he just all of a sudden there's a star there you go oh absolutely hands down and honestly I think that it's probably what got, no, got him noticed for Fifth Element because honestly, nobody else could have pulled off Ruby Rod other than Chris uh, I hate that character. <laughs> it's so irritating. <laughs> but I get I get why he was cast. I think Money Talks, of course, is the one that really brought him to the forefront. Oh, wow. Uh, and who was in Money Talks again? Wasn't it him and uh, Charlie Sheen? It was, yeah. But they really, like, this is Chris Tucker's vehicle because Charlie Sheen, by that point, his career was pretty much dead. Um... And, of course, he's not in the sequels, which we'll discuss eventually. And I and I, I was watching his stand-up special, and it's just... Well, they got they got paid nothing for this movie. It was made for $1.2 million, and it made 22 in the theaters, but it blew up on video, and that's how we have a franchise. But he didn't pay anybody, like, dividends later out of the movie, and I don't necessarily know if that's Ice Cube's fault. A lot of time, the studio just looks at the cost of things and goes, well, we just don't have anything left, or they're lying. Um, right. How Forrest Gump is still not profitable is beyond me. But if you think about how much it costs to promote and distribute a movie back when it was on film, and it only made twenty-two million dollars, you collect only half of that. You know, you're looking at a profit of twelve million, twelve million dollars. You probably already spent that promoting the movie. But they could have paid him a big paycheck, I guess, for the sequels. But by that point, he was in fucking rush hour, and he was probably asking like ten million dollars and. You, you just can't get that kind of paycheck on a sequel that you're not sure about. Like, Next Friday, you know, was never... We were never sure it was going to be a huge hit. It was, but we were never sure, you know. And then I can see them not putting the money off of Chris. But it would have been great. I love... What's the, what's the other guy's? Epps. Mike Epps. Yes. So I think it was a good trade-off. They didn't replace the character, which I hate when they do that. With That's the same character, but a different actor? Ugh. Um, but, no, and I'm glad they didn't do yeah, that. Yeah, so they just created a whole new character for him, Day Day. Uh, which I think works great. Mm, absolutely. But yeah, no, I would not put any blame, I think, on Ice Cube when it came to, like, you know, as far as making money. If anything, yeah, that probably was on New Line Cinema yeah. at the time. Who is who is the little guy that's always kind of pulls scams? I always quote him because I, I need to back you out of me. My neck in my back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, no. <laughs> he definitely lit up. Oh, God, every scene. 
as soon as you hear him like screeching and just the way he, as you just quoted, you know, when he said my neck, I had my back the way he said that. <laughs> I, I gotta look up who he is because I remember for a moment he was a thing because he was in I Got the Hookup, I think. With that that uh, mi- uh, that uh, Mr. P, what is it, Master P, uh, movie? Yeah. Oh, oh, That's there is one. okay. So there's a guy in here. He was one of the guys who wrote this, and he's the one who gets his bike stolen by uh, Debo. And uh, he does a thing after his chain is taken by his uh, by Debo that came from his grandmother. If you go back and you watch as he walks to his car, he walks like a little 13-year-old. His arms are rubber, and he's just so sad. And I think it's one of the funniest <laughs> fucking things in this whole movie. We, uh, DJ Poo, I think his name was. Yeah. Brad, right? Uh, so oh. the, the thief guy, his name is Anthony Johnson. Yes. Oh, my oh God. My and God. and, and uh, Neil Long. Uh, no, Neil Long will always be beautiful. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was the reason that song would play. Oh, she just walks into the room and like she just gives off that particular like oh the air immediately smitten yeah. and then of course you got Regina King you know played so just Anna Maria Horsford who was oh, in God. 227 and I fucking love that show no not 227 shit amen I watched both of them back to back oh you no, probably man, have, who else did? that's probably way before your time <laughs> Regina King now oh god no she was great like she's the main characters in the boondocks um, for one, and of course, a couple times Perry movies, but Watchmen was definitely, and then of course, um, oh gosh, if Beale Street could talk, she earned that Oscar big time. Yeah, I haven't seen movie. any of those. I just remember her as a kid actor, and I think I want to say she was on Two Two Seven as well. I don't know. There, so there was a Saturday nights back when there was TV. There was Golden Girls, um. Empty Nest, Amen, and 227. It was this block of comedy meant for, like, older people. But here I am at, like, eight years old going, I love this! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, that definitely was uh, before my time, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah, it was all over by, like, the mid-80s, or late 80s, whatever. It's before you were ever even born. Mm. Oh, man. And again, some of the interactions between some of the characters that would pop up, like, um, oh, gosh, Bernie Mac later as that uh, pastor... <laughs> like he was just like kind of condemning kind of condemning him for a second for using the weed for uh, Chris getting high and then he wants it a little, a little bit for his cataracts <laughs> <laughs> you can't get your own weed he's so fucking stupid though he just keeps smoking that goddamn weed he knows he's in trouble with big worm I mean big perm wait no big perm yeah, <laughs> yeah it is it's big worm <laughs> but they call him big perm yeah, he's such a fucking idiot, and they almost get killed, and I was just like, also, that was a big escalation by Big Worm. I mean, just sending strange guys to open fire like crazy, I would just think that he would show up, like, you know, and just take his ass, throw him in the vehicle, instead of, like, possibly killing uh, other people. I know, it's like, that just showed how, like, ruthless Big big Worm was. But also, at the same time, it's like, it, it, a Smokey needs to be pushing that stuff out. He's not smoking his stuff. But he needs to be pushing the product out. Yeah, so I mean, I almost, in a way, I almost think it's better to get rid of him in the role because he never gets better. At the end of the movie, he's still like, no, fuck that shit, whatever. <laughs> you know, I've lost yeah, I was bullshitting, and you know this, man. Yeah, and, and I think Day Day is a, a, a more well rounded character who has a lot more to work with than just, you know, fucking up uh, Chris's life. What was, what was Ice Cube's name again? It's his character? Craig. Craig, not Chris. Okay. Yeah, I think it's a classic for a reason. I just love the fact that Ice Cube went out there and made his own movies. I mean, that's what he did with Barbershop. Um, there was another one in there. Uh, Are We There Yet? I think he, he turned all these into franchises. And he wants to do uh, Last Friday, which is, you know, basically a legacy sequel, which is red hot right now. And I, th- I, I can see them, you know, saying, yeah, sure, let's go ahead and do this. Right. But it is like, it, it is on Warner Brothers considering they, know, they own New Line. In doing so on Friday, so yeah. Hopefully, like someday down the line, they finally give it to Ice Cube and let this happen. Yeah, I mean, it just—it was an era where, like, the last of that whole do-it-yourself kind of thing. I mean, Blumhouse started that up again with horror, but no one was really doing that with comedies, especially with black comedies, which had kind of died off during the '80s. Unless you start Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor, there were—it was just mostly like, oh, well, I guess Boys in the Hood made a lot of money, so we can only make gangsters. Well, no, some people can make comedies too, and, and those guys are trying to pioneer. You know, like there's House Party and stuff like that. Yeah, oh, speaking of House Party, they did reboot that. And, I saw, yeah. I mean, come on, if they can, re- if they can reboot that, they can give us Last Friday. Yeah. 
So we'll see what happens. Uh, that is it for this episode. Anything else you want to say before we go? Um, honestly, yeah. No, you know, I'm going to have to rewatch that uh, director's cut again for Friday. You know, especially before Good Friday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. That's it, everybody. Have a good one. Wait, I forgot. We can't leave until you sign us off. What the fuck am I doing? Go ahead. Sorry, I, Jacob. I, I know. It's like, gosh, you did it was my turn to roll, Michael. I know. It was like the first time in four years I've done that. Like no, may, maybe eight years that I've done that. <laughs> no, no, no. Just this once. Okay. <laughs> all right, all right. All right, everybody. Namaste. Good luck. And be excellent to each other. And party on, dudes. And you got knocked the fuck out. <laughs> 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 <laughs>